get into the Word of God. And we're going to continue looking at something we've been looking at for quite a while, which is the subject of Zion. Zion is a realm. Zion is a place that was in ancient Jerusalem. Um, it's still there. But the concept of Zion has broadened in a sense and deepened because really Zion is the dwelling place of God. And in our dispensation, if you like, in, in our time, in our era, in our uh, eon, Zion is the people of God. So when we read about Zion and we put it into a Christian context, a church age, a Christian era context, um, then we understand that God is speaking about Zion and it's not so much a physical place anymore, but Zion is the people of God. You could actually um, quite easily broaden that in a sense, as we, we've seen here in Isaiah 52, to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem, of course, was what Zion was. And Zion then became uh, not just a, a mountain or a hill in uh, ancient Jerusalem, it became the name for the whole city and eventually became the name for the whole nation. Um, so there's this concept of Zion being where God dwells. Uh, and so, of course, I, Isaiah was speaking hundreds of years before the Savior, uh, but these particular chapters from about, I think, uh, Howard Rand used to say, I think from Isaiah 40 onwards, in particular, God was speaking to an end time people in the isles of the sea, in the coastlands, in the, the, the uh, ends of the earth. And, of course, we see all that in this chapter. Last week, we looked at Isaiah 51. There are there are two things, two, two passages in Isaiah where God is saying to Zion. And there are other things about Zion that we'll look at today if we have time. I'm happy for this just to keep going on in time. Um, you know, we're not in any rush because this is such a wonderful subject. But if we get to it today, Isaiah speaks a lot about Zion. And his, the things he says are all last day stuff, including these verses, these chapters. So Isaiah 51 verse 16 said, I've put my words in thy mouth and I've covered thee in the shadow of mine hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. That word plant in Hebrew means to strike down, to strike down deep. You know, how many know that if you're, you're, um, you're planting in your garden or if you're building, it's the same idea, then you, you do so, uh, you, you plant a a, a, a deep foundation when you're building and when you're putting roots down you put them down as deep as, as you need to do amen not just surface stuff you know I remember doing a number of uh, conifers in the back garden uh, and I didn't plant them deep enough so they all died they might have died anyway but they, they, they weren't buried deep enough so planting the heavens mean and that's what happened in the Reformation. That's what happened here in Scotland when John Knox had the Reformation. The Reformation, God's servant, John Knox, uh, God used him to plant the heavens very deep into Scottish life and society. So much so that for hundreds of years, we followed what you know, John Knox had planted. And even today, there are still vestiges of it, but there are many ungodly that have tried to rip it up and pull up the roots and attack the foundations. But I want to say this to you, what's coming is going to be deeper and wider and greater, even than what God accomplished in the Scottish Reformation. Amen? You know, we, we sang that uh, Psalm 100, uh, which all people on earth do dwell. And if you notice in your hymn book, it says the Scottish Psalter. That is sung all over the world. All people that on earth do dwell is universal. And it came from the Scottish Psalter. As many hymns did, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, he, maketh, he makes me down to lie. What happened is that what God did in Scotland reached the whole earth. Yeah. Amen? And we tend to forget that. Oh, well, you know. But let me just say this to you. What God did in Scotland impacted the nations. You know, if, if America would never be where it is today yeah. if it weren't for the influence of what we could call Scottish Christianity and the people of God going over. Uh, it's not the only land God used, but let me just say this to you. We ought to be, and, and the right way, proud of, of our heritage as Scots. Amen. And you know, I'm going to say this to you as well. It's easily provable if you go and study it. John Knox and the Covenanters who followed him strongly and deeply believed in the union of the United Kingdom. In fact, they were the major proponents of it when, he, when, he, when no one else was interested. 
when it wasn't popular. They were the ones that preached it, proclaimed it, that God wanted union in these British Isles between all the separate countries to come together. And by the way, we've said this quite a lot, we didn't become partners in the union because there's no partners in a union. You know, when you get married, it's not partners. That's why they, they say when people um, stay together and they're not married, they call them partners. Oh, my partner. When someone says that, you know right away, it's not your wife, it's not your husband. Because in, in marriage, there's a union. And what does it say? The two shall become one flesh. And that's what God did in our nation. That's what God did with Scotland, England, uh, Wales, and Ireland. He made us one. So, uh, uh, David and I used to say this a lot. Scotland is not part of the United Kingdom. No. Scotland is the United Kingdom. Just as England is. Just as Wales is. And just as Northern Ireland is. And by the grace and mercy and power of God, may the South follow suit and go back into that union. And all the Isles. Anyway... And we're not being political about that because the union is for the gospel's sake. Amen. You know, the first independent uh, campaigner was the devil. Amen. The devil wanted independence and he got it. But look at the price he's paid. And look at the damage he's caused. Anyway, let's get into this. So uh, here's a message to Zion in Isaiah 51. Thou art my people. So we can say we are the people. We are God's people. We are the people. We are the people of God. We are the Zion people of God. We are the sheep of his flock. Amen? Uh, and you know, people don't like you using that phrase, particularly here in Scotland, particular people. Anyway, Isaiah 52 is where we're at because here we find, and, and incidentally, let me say this to you, Isaiah didn't write uh, 60 odd chapters of the Bible. Okay. He didn't break it down into chapter and verse like we understand it, if, if that makes sense. What he did was he, he, he had the book of the prophet Isaiah. So if there were no chapter and verse uh, headings here, um, what would happen is you'd find that it's not a lot of verses between this message to Zion in Isaiah 51, Thou art my people, to the one that we're going to look at today, which is verse 7. Another message to Zion, Thy God reigneth. But let's just read into it. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. There is an argument that you could make here that when God is speaking to Zion and God is speaking to Jerusalem, he's speaking to the same, the same people or the same thing. Zion and Jerusalem were interchangeable names by this point in time for the city of Jerusalem. And you could even argue for the whole nation. Okay? So... Um, it's a wee bit like, if you understand this, uh, we, we like to go, as you know, to the Isle of Butte. But we'll, we talk about going to Rossi. And many people, oh, we're going to Rossi. What they mean is they're going to the island. But Rossi is just the main town in the island. Butte is the name of the island. But it's inter people know that we go to Rossi. What they mean is you're going to the Isle of Butte. And here, Jerusalem and Zion are just really different interchangeable names. Okay? The Holy City. You see, God is building a holy city. He's doing that right now. It's the new Jerusalem that will come down from above. Amen? And so God is in the process right now. Because we're still in time, we're not in eternity, God is building a holy city, and he's building it with living stones. And each of you that know the Lord is what are one of those stones. So he's still building a holy city, the new Jerusalem that will come down from above. And it says here, there are no more come into thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Awake, awake. Now, if I don't grab myself here, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't, uh, because this is what God's put in my heart. Uh, the burning theme right now is the Great Awakening. One of our friends, Liz, went over to Colorado, and uh, I had to stop uh, the sin of covetousness. Uh, she went over to Colorado, um, and she went to one of Andrew Womack's meetings and she brought me this wee pack back. Uh, and Andrew Womack is a guy who's very much, um, you know, he, he did a lot for, uh, not just, I don't mean the Trump campaign, but for the things of God that are right in America. And he, he so th this pack was full of wee books like that. Um, and she gave me another book on the loan. Um, really all about what God was doing in America today, particularly through what Trump's doing. But this wee book, The Great Awakening, 
uh, Andrew Womack wrote, which is really basically saying, and he says very clearly in the book, he, the, the Americans speak about uh, two, the two great awakenings, which one, of course, was George Whitfield, and the second was later on, I think Finney was part of that and other people. But he's saying that God said to him that the third great awakening. So to the Americans, the great awakening that's coming is the third great awakening. I don't know that we would make that distinguish that distinction here uh, in Britain, although George Whitfield was from Britain. Amen. Um, but praise God, he came to Scotland and did mighty works. If you've ever been to preaching braise at Camber Slang, then on that wee uh, natural amphitheatre we've been, it's wonderful. 30,000 people came to hear God's servant bring the gospel to Scotland and other places. Anyway, so Andrew Womack says that the Lord's told them that the Great Awakening is not coming, the Third Great Awakening. It's already here. And I believe that because, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to have visions in my bedroom. Uh, I used to go into my bedroom, have these visions God showed me, and I didn't maybe have an adequate word to describe what it was. I'd have maybe said revival, but this is before I even gave my heart to the Lord. Um, but I now know God was showing me the, the great awakening. I've known for quite some time that's coming. Now here maybe we would call it the end time Elijah move of God, the end time Elijah outpouring. In other words, the great harvest that's to come. And so it was a thrill to read this. And of course, the Bible says, awake to righteousness. Doesn't it? I think it's in 1 Corinthians. It says, awake to righteousness. Is it 1 Corinthians? Anyway, it's in the New Testament. And sin not. And here's the thing. The great awakening is going to turn the nation to righteousness. See, awakening and revival are different things. Revival may be touch, touch a church, touch a community. It can touch a, a, a territory or a region. It can even touch a nation. But in awakening, all of society swings back towards righteousness. So that even people who aren't born again, they're not saved, they're not Christians, but, but they, 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 they have a longing for decency and modesty and, and things to be right. They don't want... Uh, 78 genders, they don't want the woke stuff, they want to go back to things that are decent and they understand it's God's word. You know, uh, let's not kid ourselves when we talk about uh, when Scotland uh, was the land of the book and the people of the book, they weren't all Christians, they weren't all, but they all went to church, they all were nominal, but they all, there were standards of, standards of righteousness. Righteousness is the plumb line that comes back into society when God sends awakening. And he doesn't do it very often. And we fixate on revival and we fixate on, on smaller things. And I believe at this time in the earth, God is saying, I want to send to my servant nations, Britain and America, the awakening that both nations need. And I believe... You know, and I know a lot of people, oh, you can't say that. I believe Trump is the sign of that. I don't believe that Trump is Billy Graham. I don't believe that God, he was elected because he was Billy Graham. But I believe that because of Trump, I mean, need to pray for that man because he can take wrong paths. I was sharing yesterday at the gathering, Boris Johnson. I remember when T Theresa May was the prime minister and Boris Johnson was nowheresville politically. She didn't like him. She didn't want him in her cabinet or anywhere near cabinet. And I remember one day Theresa May was making such a mess of it. And I remember going to the Lord very clearly saying, Lord, who's going to be our next prime minister? And instantly, I don't, I mean, there was no delay. The Lord said to me, Boris Johnson. And then he said to me, my servant Johnson. And I thought, well, okay, praise the Lord. Don't see it happening in the natural, but God, you know, I, I, I know the voice of God. And I, just a few months later, guess who was the next leader of the Tory party? Guess who was the next Prime Minister? Boris Johnson. And I knew I was clever, I was, I was clever enough. I was mature enough to understand that when God says uh, Johnson, and even my servant Johnson, I didn't mean Boris Johnson was an anointed servant of God, you know, preaching the gospel. But I knew that what God was saying, I will do through him. My purpose. And of course, he was greatly responsible for some of the Brexit thing becoming manifest reality. And yet, it wasn't that long into his premiership, Boris Johnson became a liability. And, and the Lord said to me, he's taken the wrong path. 
and it got it got too late. And and those of us who who who, who understood realized he's got to go and, and prayed him out. So just because Donald Trump, God's using Trump, and I believe he is using Trump in America right now, and let's not pretend, well, that's America, that's, that's over the Atlantic. How does that impact us? Let me just tell you, the president, sorry, the present president, the current president of the United States will impact your life greatly if he leads us into nuclear war with the Russians. You'll know the impact that an American president can have. This has nothing to do with politics, by the way. It's all to do with understanding how God moves in the nations through rulers of nations. And that's why, as we do every Sunday, every Lord's Day, we just prayed for kings and all that in authority. And we didn't pray for Trump, but we'll do it at the end. Amen? In response to this. Now, it's not a message about President Trump. It's a message about what God's going to do in the last days. Because these prophecies from Isaiah, now I believe that at any point in history up till now, and especially in the Christian era, you could take these verses and apply them. But this, I believe, is the time where the prophet saw that these things would become absolutely, you know, God's word to us now. The prophetic word should always be God's word to us now. But there comes a time where it really is now. And I believe we're in that time. So he's talking um, to, because as I is addressing in these chapters, the people of God, the Zion of God, uh, in the isles and the ends of the earth. He's talking to people in Scotland. He's talking to people in the British Isles, the ends of the earth. It's not just some, oh, well, you know, as far as things go. No, the ends of the earth was a specific geographical location in Scripture. A great deal of the time, they knew what the ends of the earth meant. It meant the northern coastlands of Europe and beyond into the isles of the sea because the British Isles were very much known to these people at this time. There was a lot of trade went back and forth uh, by, by the Isaiah's time for hundreds of years at least. So he's talking to people in the ends of the earth. Okay, let's just keep going. So he says, you shake thyself from the dust. So awake, awake. In other words, we have to awake. The, the great awakening means that there's an awakening. Awake! Amen. Something's happened to awaken the people. Something, and by the way, this is not just uh, people that don't know the Lord. It's not, you know, people of other faiths and so on. He's, I believe he's, because he's talking to Zion. He says, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. It's the principal message here is to the people of God, to you and I. Amen. Amen. So, shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. And we know what that means in the Hebrew. It means, because when you think about it, arise and sit down. What does that mean? Arise and sit down. Well, actually, in Hebrew, if you go and study it, the sit down, what he's saying, it means upon thrones of prominence. So, like we spoke about earlier, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So, what he's saying is, arise and, and sit in the seat of authority that God has called you. You see, when you pray for the nation... You're not doing so as a beggar, as a mendicant, squalling and bawling and pleading. Oh, Lord, you're doing so as someone who is seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Amen. The place of prayer in the new covenant is a place of authority. And dominion over the things of the devil. And dominion over the things of earth. It's not a place of arrogance. You can't come arrogantly. But you can come with authority and confidence in that authority. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Here's what God's saying to an end time Zion people. You're captive. Loose yourself from the bands. We don't like to think of ourselves as captive, but let me ask you a question. What can, what can you do today as a New Testament Protestant Christian believer in Christ? Uh, what can you say uh, that won't get you into trouble? Uh, and here's, oh well, we need to be careful. Here's why we need to be careful, because we have the fear of man. The fear of man brings a snare, brings, brings bondage. Amen? So we live in a society today where you, can, you can't say certain things. You know, you live in a society today where if someone is trans and you misgender them, you'll get a knock at your door. you lose your job. you lose your livelihood. Because you called... Uh, you know, it's like Johnny Cash, a boy named Sue. <laughs> you called 
Sue a boy, and Sue wants to be identified as they. And you're going to trouble for doing that. Because they'll say you did it malicious. Oh, you're one of those Christians. Well, that's hate crime. Captive daughter of Zion means the people of God are held captive and in bondage to woke ideology. And I want to say today, God is smashing that to pieces. And praise God, I'll tell you who's going to be the wrecking ball to that. This time more than last time. We looked yesterday, by the way, at the significance of 47. Okay, in Psalm 47, I won't, I won't preach it because we did it yesterday. Psalm 47, what does it say in that Psalm? Sound the trump! Yeah. <laughs> it says sound the trumpet, but a trump is a trumpet. Amen? And it's not, oh, you know, God, Donald Trump's my hero. It's what the man signifies. God's just using this election in America to free America and to free those in the Western world if we'll seize the opportunity, if we just be lazy about it and, you know, oh, well, you know, that's great. It's just, just politics. But if we understand that it's just a sign that God is moving in the earth to, to raise the plumb line again of righteousness in the earth and in God's uh, servant nations, that, that we'll go back to that plumb line. We'll go back to standards. Our laws and customs will again revert back to biblical standards and biblical, the biblical plumb line. God's doing that right now. And our job is to cooperate with that, isn't it? As the people of God. So anyway, thus saith the Lord, you sold yourselves, you, can, you shall be redeemed without money. Thus saith the Lord God, my people went down a four time. Let's just jump, then he talks about how we'll know his name. We won't take his name in vain. Now, a lot of people just, uh, you know, a lot of people say the name of Jesus more than some Christians, but they never say it in reverence. Verse 7 is where I want to go. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Okay, if you're bringing good tidings, you will have beautiful feet. You will need Dr. Scholl's you know, wart removers, veruca remover, uh, you know, foot creams. You'll have beautiful feet if you preach the gospel. Amen. You ought to look after your feet. You ought to have be say over and over, I've got beautiful feet. Because God is looking for people with beautiful feet because they're the ones that will bring good news. Amen. So, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Now that doesn't mean, well, I need to be a Monroe bagger. I need to climb all the Monroes. I need to go to the Trossachs. I need to go to the Cairn Gorms and get up that, you know, I'm going to go up the Cairn Gorms and preach the gospel. Well, there's nobody there. He's not talking about mountains as in mountains. He's talking about mountains as a metaphor. And in scripture, mountains as a metaphor means um, empires, kingdoms, powers in the earth. Okay, France is an empire. The EU is an empire. Of course, Britain is an empire. Uh, there are empires, and I'll tell you other empires, Facebook, Twitter, anywhere where people congregate together in, in great amounts, there are mountains, smaller are hills. Okay, it's just a metaphor for kingdoms, empires, powers, nations, and so on. So he's saying here, and it's interesting, and we're going to look at something else in relation to this, if we've got time, dear, the time always goes away. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that, brings, that preaches the gospel. <coughs> that publisheth peace, 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 peace. The message of God, the message of the gospel, the message of the kingdom is not war, it's peace. Men in the earth today are warmongering, trying to bring war to us. Politicians, powers, merchants of the earth. In other words, the elite. And this is not conspiracy theory. The Bible makes it clear that this is what's going on. This is why the nations are in a tumult, because the kings of the earth have set themselves against the Lord, against God, and against his anointed, Antichristos, against his son, the Lord Jesus. In other words, it's an Antichrist conspiracy. So he says here, the beautiful upon the mountains, the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publisheth peace, because God wants peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. This message will save you. That saith... Unto who? Unto Zion, thy God reigneth. That saith unto God's people. Now what is Zion today? We say, well, if Zion is God's people and Zion is where God dwells. Where is Zion today? Brothers and sisters, 
You're part of Zion. You are Zion because Zion, man is the habitation of God. If you know Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, if your sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then, then Zion is who you are because God dwells in you. And God is saying to you right now, thy God reigneth. Now, Paul interprets that. Don't have time again to get into it. Might do it on another, another occasion. But over in Romans 10, Paul quotes this, and he misses out that bit where it says, Thy God reigneth. And the reason is, he's already said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, and it says uh, in the Greek, if you'll confess and say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that God has raised him from the dead, you believe that, he says you'll be saved. Salvation comes by proclaiming the lordship of Jesus. So we would upgrade that now to the new covenant to say, uh, thy God reigns means Jesus is Lord. Yes. Now that's a message of salvation that, that can regenerate the Adamic human spirit. What can it do if we say it over a nation? What can we do if we say what can it do if we say over Cumbernauld, over Glasgow, over Blantyre, over your household, over your loved ones, over your family, over your job? Because that message of Jesus as Lord is the very heart. Because what it's saying is far above all principality and power, far above all things that you'll find in this earth or in the, the, the world to come or in heaven or on earth, far above, God has raised Jesus to sit at his right hand and, and be Lord over all. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess he's Lord. And here's the thing. He said that you and I are seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. Yep. Amen. That same Christ who dwells in heaven above, far above everything, is the same Christ that lives in your heart if you know him as Lord and Saviour. Publish it. He's saying, this is beautiful. Your feet are going to be beautiful if you spread this message. See, I believe that the message that will bring the great awakening to its fullness of reality and revelation and manifestation in the earth is the message of the Lordship of Christ. When, every, when, when, when all that, that we say is really saying, you know, Jesus is Lord of all this. And, and, and let me prove it to you in Isaiah again. Let's go back. There's so much I want to say about here. You know, notice here he says here in verse 10, all the ends of the earth. Oh, let's look at verse 9. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. Do you know that the word Gangad means waste places? It means rough ground. Yeah, well, it's rough here. It's rough to... to, to to, to preach the gospel here, it's rough. People always say, oh, it must be hard for you there. Well, let me just say this to you. Break forth in a joy if you're in the waste places of Jerusalem. Amen? It's not hard. It's a joy to preach the gospel in the waste places and see what God's going to do. As Sister Pearl used to pray, she, the burden she had for this, she called it Tharsa Street, but she meant the whole area. It, to know that God's going to move mightily in this place and all the people sitting in their houses just now or lying in their, their bed just now or taking drugs just now or doing whatever they're doing just now, they're all going to end up coming here because the, as we're going to see the waste places of Jerusalem become uh, the, Zy the Eden of God. Yes, amen. Anyway, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 2. Oh, sorry, verse 10. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of, the, of our God. The ends of the earth, as I said, uh, understood to be the isles of the sea, the isles of the west by the ancients. So all of Britain's going to see this. All the British isles. Okay, I'll say it again, including Ireland. The whole of Ireland. Ireland will be united again in the gospel and under the throne of David in the earth. Hallelujah. Anyway, Isaiah chapter 2 and then we'll close. Now I might take about 45 minutes in Isaiah chapter 2. Then. Isaiah chapter 2. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. There's a whole sermon in there. But we won't go there. It shall come to pass in the last days. Are we living in the last days, brothers and sisters? You know, every single tick of that clock brings us deeper into the last days. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, the mountain of the Lord's house, He's still talking about mountains, or he, he was talking about mountains in Isaiah 2 as he was later on. The mountain of the Lord's house, which means the kingdom of God, or the Zion of God, because that's what the Lord's house was, it was Zion. But it's the kingdom of God, representing God's kingdom, because mountains represent kingdoms. The mountain of the Lord's house, which is Zion, which is the kingdom of God, shall be established, firmly established, is, is what it means. It's planted in the top of the mountains. Again, he's not saying, well, there's going to be a church on the top of Ben Nevis. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking about mountains. Literally, he's talking about powers. All the powers that we see, all oh, the G7 and this and that and, and America and the EU and, and, and all these powers, China, Russia, all of these things. Okay, what he's saying is that in the top of the mountains, and the meaning here in Hebrew is very clear, sitting on top of the mountains, not, you know, part, part of the mountain range, on top. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So we would say this is Zion, and of course Zion today is the ecclesia of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God in the earth. Brothers and sisters, all nations shall flow. See, when you talk about the last days or the end times, everybody wants to talk about all that futurist stuff. You know, but what does it say here in the last days? That all nations shall flow to the Zion of God. All nations. And then it says, uh, and many people, verse 2, shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, or to Zion, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. What, look what it says, for, for, for out of where? Out of Zion. Out of Zion. Out of the people of God. Out of God, what God is doing in the earth today. Out of where God dwells, his ecclesia, which, which is his agency in the earth. The kingdom of God in manifest uh, reality in the earth. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In other words, people will not just take their cue. They will see as law and, and completely uh, have no indication or desire to oppose what comes from God's people, the Zion people of God, from the word of God, from the kingdom of God, from the throne of God. They won't oppose it because the word will go forth and they will, they will say, we need, to do, we need to do this. This is the right way to, to look at laws. This is the right way to look at gender. This is the right way to look at how we govern. This is the right way to how we live. This is the right way to how we, how we, 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 we treat one another. This is the right way to how we look after our bodies. And then, just in closing, <coughs> I need to point this out to you, because I did yesterday and I've been doing it a lot lately. Verse 4, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. They will, rather than invest in weapons of mass destruction and nuclear capabilities and new missiles, they will put that money, that effort, that energy, that research into maybe things like health and, and housing and looking after the put. In other words, they will use their money, their, their, their power and their resources and their wealth for the benefit of mankind, not so that they can wipe out millions in the nuclear holocaust. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. If you're at all clued up and looking at the media just now, you know that there's this threat, this spectre of World War III. But this word of God here, this prophecy saying, you know, we're in the time where out of Zion shall go forth the word that's going to put an end to that. And I believe again, you know, what Trump said. Uh, I'm not saying Trump... Zion, but what, what Trump says, the first day in office, he put an end to the Ukraine war. Yeah, I believe him. That's why they're all trying to get the war kicked off before he comes, to destroy, to destroy the peace. <coughs> because God publisheth peace. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. <coughs> Excuse me, you know, you had to learn war when you were a kid, didn't you? You went to school and there was... You, know, you had to learn fighting. <coughs> it wasn't natural, maybe for some. 
maniac cycle kids it, it was. But mankind has to learn war. <coughs> and God's saying there's coming a time where they won't do that anymore. Now I'm going to close with this. I'm closing this thing. We'll sing our final hymn. Our choice, I believe, <coughs> in the earth today, because this is going to come to pass because God's word will bring it to pass. The question for mankind today is, will we experience this to save us from World War III? And we'll put down our weapons and we'll, we'll turn to the Lord. And the great awakening will be that mankind came to the very brink of nuclear oblivion and pulled back because the words here and what we've looked at today, because Zion, the people of God, were preaching <coughs> the word of the Lord. Will that be a reality? Or will we have to go through that war and then come to our senses and then say, well, we're not going to learn war anymore? But hundreds of millions will die if that takes place. The second option. So brothers and sisters, I'll leave you with a burden of prayer. I urge you to pray. It's not, oh well, who's the bad guys? Who's the, the good guys? Is Putin the bad guy? Is, is Zelensky the good guy? It's not even about that. It's that God's purpose in the earth is Isaiah chapter 2. Is that, that the gospel be preached to all the nations and then the end shall come. Okay? So what I'm, I would urge you to do, let's do it together. <coughs> we said we'd pray for Trump. We've already prayed for our own nation. Let's bow our heads very quickly before we sing our last hymn. Father, we come before you. Lord, we've heard your word today. We do believe, O oh God, that your word shall come to pass. Every last word that we've said, you, every full stop, everything. But Lord, we also understand that, that Lord, that we're not fatalists, Lord, that well. There's nothing we can do. I do believe, Lord, that burdens of responsibility are put on us. And so, Lord, we pray right now that this man, Donald Trump, will come into office in January, if not before, effectively. But, Lord, that he will indeed be used by you as an instrument, a sounding of the trump, Lord, to bring peace. But, Lord, we understand that it's out of Zion that the world's future is determined. So we pray today as your Zion people and ask, Lord, let there be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Let the gospel thunder forth. Let men and women be saved in multitudes, swept into the kingdom. Let us see that great awakening manifest here in Scotland, here in Glasgow, here in Blanta, here in Cumbernauld, here in the north of this city. In Jesus' name, amen.